Okay, this is gravitational uh, fields lesson three. This is where we start to relate gravity to circular motion. Um, and obviously the, that applies to the orbits of planets and also the orbits of satellites. Um, but before we get into this too much, what we really want to think about is what are the forces on any object. So a force on the object on the surface of the Earth. So could you draw a diagram showing all the forces acting if a one kilogram mass is placed on a balance on the surface of the Earth? Could you talk about how those forces relate to each other? And could you say which one gives the balance reading? So here's my diagram. So I've got my object here. It's sat on this yellow square, which is the balance, sat on this big blue thing, which is the Earth. And we're going to just pretend now that the Earth's not spinning. Okay, so those are the only things. So, what forces have we got? Well, we know we've got the force of the Earth on the mass. That's the weight of the object, isn't it? Okay. But, unfortunately, a lot of um, students get the idea early on in their life that there's, when they draw the equal and opposite force, because remember Newton's third law says that there must be an equal and opposite force to that, what they do is they draw a force from the balance and they assume that those two forces are equal. Okay, but this comes from drawing free body diagrams. If we're only considering the forces on the red block and we know the red block is in equilibrium, then these two forces are, are equal, but they're not necessarily equal. Because if you remember Newton's third law properly, if body A exerts a force on body B, then body B exerts a force on body A, which is of equal magnitude in the opposite direction. Okay, so said more simply, the force of the, the opposite force to the force of the Earth on the mass is the force of the mass on the Earth. So there's an equal uh, magnitude in opposite direction force, right, which is the gravitational effect of the mass pulling the Earth. Now you may imagine that wouldn't be equal, but you can think about it mathematically. You know it's g m one m two, so the two masses multiplied together, it doesn't matter which one we're considering. Okay, you may say to me, well, the red block only must create a tiny a tiny gravitational field, which of course it does, but then it's acting on the huge mass of the Earth, so this creates an equal force. Okay, so it looks from that like the red block should be falling, but of course it's not because someone's put the balance in the way. Okay, so there must be a force of the balance on the mass, and then there must be an equal and opposite force to that, which is the force of the mass on the balance. So the one that's actually being measured is the force of the mass on the balance. And if everything's stationary, that will be equal to the force of the Earth on the mass, but it doesn't have to be equal to it. Okay, so we can look at some examples about this by thinking about the way the Earth really is. So there's a couple of things here to consider. The first of all, um, the fact that the Earth's not quite spherical, so the Earth's slightly squashed, exaggerate it hugely. Um, so the equatorial radius is bigger than the polar radius. Um, so we can just use our conventional equations that we've used to work out, putting in different values for R, we get the difference between 9.81 and 9.87 actually at the pole. Um, but then more importantly, we can think about the resultant force on the one kilogram mass at the equator and the pole. Well, maybe I've got these questions the wrong way around, because at the pole, it's simple. Okay, the resultant force is zero because it just sits there, minding its own business. But at the equator, right, it's not in equilibrium. At the equator, it's got to go round in this circle. So we've got to remember the crucial bit that uh, we have to understand for all this stuff and go back to our idea of circular motion. So the, f the resultant force must be enough to keep it in that circular motion, a centripetal force. Okay, m omega squared r. Okay, omega, the angular velocity, is 2 pi, 86,400 seconds in a day. So there's the angular velocity squared. Here's the radius of the Earth at the equator, which gives the resultant force of 3.37 times 10 to the minus 2 newtons. Okay, not enough so that if you go to the equator you're going to feel really light, okay, but definitely a measurable resultant force. Okay, at the pole, it's not accelerating, it's not going 
around in a circle, or if you like it is, but the radius of the circle is zero. Okay, so no resultant force. So if you put this object on the balance at these two places, at the equator, because if we go back previously, the two forces aren't balanced, this force here, the force of the Earth on the mass, and the force of the balance on the mass are not the same size, okay, because there must be a resultant force of 0 0.0337, 0 0.34, I've written here, newtons, okay. So it would only seem to weigh 9.78, but on the pole it would appear to weigh 9.87. Okay, so when they make you use 9.81 for the gravitational field strength, really I think that's a bit silly because gravity appears to be different in different parts of the Earth anyway. Okay, 9.8 is quite a good approximation there for most situations. But of course, this is the gravitational force. 9.81 is the field strength. Okay, it's just that the weight that you perceive okay, does not come from that. You don't actually feel your own weight. What you feel is the force of the um, chair as you're sitting there reading this. You're feeling the force of the chair pushing you up. It just happens that those two forces are, um, generally speaking, quite similar. Okay, so you can imagine now that if those two aren't the same, if the Earth was to spin fast enough, you could actually be on the equator and feel weightless. Okay, weightless is a very tricky term in all of this. Okay, you've all seen film, I'm sure, of people going around in um, the space station and such things looking as if they're weightless. But hopefully you've worked out by now there is quite a big force of gravity on them. Right, but they are just in free fall towards the Earth. Okay, so we know that the force of gravity is mg. And we know the force for circular motion is m omega squared r, the centripetal force. Okay, so if we make those two forces equal, the first thing you'll notice there is it doesn't matter what the mass is. Okay, so we get g, the effect of gravity is omega squared r, omega squared r is the centripetal acceleration. Okay, so if we substitute in omega equals 2 pi over t, we get this expression. Okay, if we just square and then cross multiply we get t squared is 4 pi squared r over g okay put in the radius of the earth there divide it by 9.81 okay and you'll get about 5000 seconds which is about 85 minutes so if a day was only 85 minutes people living on the equator would actually feel weightless okay it wouldn't be that they are weightless they would have exactly the same weight as they've got now but that weight would only be just about enough to hold them in circular motion. Okay, that might sound like a bizarre quali um, calculation, but in fact, if you think about it, that's exactly what happens with satellites. They're in free fall, so the ones that are close to the Earth do go around in about 90 minutes, because they're slightly higher above the Earth. They go around in about 90 minutes. If they went any slower, gravity would pull them down. If they went any faster, gravity wouldn't be strong enough to hold onto them, and they'd escape. Okay, so we can apply the same thing for circular motion at any given distance. So this is the force towards the center, gmm over r squared. This is the force required for circular motion, mv squared over r. We're using m2 here as the mass of the, of the satellite going round. Okay, so we cancel out the M2s. It doesn't matter what the mass of the satellite is. It's going to be harder to get it up there, as we'll see later. Okay, but it'll have to travel at the same speed, which is quite handy, because that means that the satellites at the same distance are all travelling at different speeds and crashing into each other. They're all going around at pretty much the same speed. Okay, so we can use this to calculate, for example, the speed of the Moon. If we've got the radius of the Moon's orbit and the two masses. Um, so... We know that V squared equals GM over R. Let me just do that again in case you've missed that. So M2 V squared over R, this is the centripetal force, is GM1 M2 over R squared. So this one of the R's cancels, the M2 cancels out, and we get to this expression. So the speed of the moon is just less than a 1,000 metres per second. Um, to calculate the period of its orbit, Okay, then we can just do 
time equals distance over speed but the distance remember it's not coming to the earth and back it's going round the circle of its orbit is 2 pi r over v so it takes about 29 days for the moon to go around the earth okay there's uh, some complications there you might think that's a bit long but you have to that's uh, slightly longer than the period between full moons but there's reasons for that which you might want to think about and explain whether it would matter if the moon was less massive well we've cancelled out the m2s here haven't we yeah so this is the mass of the moon m2 the thing that's going round okay you can see that from this side okay that this is the object that's going round okay so you haven't done it you can look back through that slide and you'll notice that although it gave you the mass of the moon you didn't actually use it okay polar orbits are about a thousand kilometers a bit less sometimes calculate the period of their orbit well again the same equation um, gives you a velocity of 7.34 times 10 to the 3 meters per second so they're traveling at some something around 7300 meters per second okay which means they take about 1.76 hours okay somewhere between 90 minutes and a bit more depending on how high that 1000 is okay some of them are a bit lower than that but that sort of period to go around the orb uh, around the orbit Okay, it should say at this point that if you're going straight to time, you might want to use the omega squared equation. So you can do uh, g m m over r squared equals m omega squared r. Okay, in this case, oops, sorry, I should put r squared. Sorry, in this case, the r's don't cancel out. Um, the m2 still cancel out, of course. So you end up with omega squared equals g m over r cubed okay so that can take you straight to omega which is sometimes the neater way to do it geosynchronous or geostationary orbits have a period of 24 hours so what height do they need to be okay again same equation okay we can get this the time is 2 pi r over v so we can work out how fast they've got to go okay so just some algebra there um so we get to this equation which we'll come back to later um, which is r cubed equals g m t squared over 4 pi squared um, let me just take you through that so this is where we started from again this is the time for one orbit is 2 pi r over v rearrange that so you get the velocity is 2 pi over t okay so what we do then is we substitute in um, for v squared so we can take this expression and put it over for v so we've got to square everything there make these two equal so this is v squared equals this um, just multiply it by the r and the t squared and we get this so we end up with this expression right which we will come back to later quite handy which gives us that they've got to be about 4.23 times 10 to the 7 that's the radius of the orbit um, sometimes they do ask you for the height of the orbit above the surface of the earth like I have done here so don't forget to knock off the radius of the earth okay last one of these so the Sun uh, is 150 million kilometers from the earth 1.5 times 10 to 11 meters from the earth what's the mass of the Sun so same equation again but we need to work out how fast the Earth's moving. Um, so I've done this algebraically, but the same kind of steps. Um, so we end up with 4 pi squared r cubed over gt squared. Okay, we know the time. 86,400 is the number of seconds in a day times 365 um, days in a year. Let's not worry about leap, year, leap years. Okay, so we get from that that the mass of the Sun is about 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms.